Hello Electra heads! At the time of recording this, we are just a few days away from the unveiling of one of the most hotly anticipated new electric cars of the year. The new range-topping Uber Limo, the Mercedes EQS. In fact, by the time this video goes live, the EQS will have been revealed. Here's a photo of it. What do you think about it? No, seriously, I'm asking. I haven't seen it yet. That's the thing about making YouTube videos, it's kind of like crappy time travel. Now, there is no denying that the EQS is a very exciting car. It's the first Merc to utilize the brand's all-new, dedicated EV architecture. That's a very big deal. It also basically has one massive screen for the dashboard. That's also cool, I guess. And what's more, like the petrol-powered S-Class before it, the EQS will more than likely debut a load of fancy new safety features and tech that five or ten years from now will be standard equipment on cheaper cars. To give you some idea, in the past, big Luxo Mercs have introduced the world to anti-lock brakes, crumple zones, airbags, adaptive cruise control, lane assist. So yeah, new big electric Merc flagship. Big deal. And yet... I'm just finding it quite difficult to get really excited for this one. Because as much as I love drooling over expensive high-end sh** that I will never be able to afford, and I do, watching the launch of yet another very expensive luxury EV is starting to feel a bit like someone trying to sell me a big expensive bottle of champagne when I just want a glass of water. Which is my fancy way of saying, yes, it's very cool, but where are all the new cheap EVs, the ones that we really need, the ones that normal people can afford? Now, in fairness to Merck, they're not exactly known for making little budget econo boxes. That's not really their thing. The problem is that the brands that are good at making little budget econo boxes are also busy making big, posh, expensive EVs. The Honda E, the only electric Honda on sale right now, starts at 28 grand. That is 10,000 pounds more than Honda's cheapest petrol model. The new Mustang Mach-E, the only electric Ford you can buy right now, that is 41,000 pounds. It starts at 25 grand more than Ford's cheapest petrol model. So the question that we're tackling in this video today is one that I've seen you guys write in the comments of our videos a thousand times over. Why are EVs so expensive? And when are the cheap ones coming? Before we get into this, please do make sure to like and subscribe. Leave a comment down below to let me know what is your favorite current cheapo EV, because there are a few. I like the Seat Me Electric, personally. Now then, first things first, why are electric cars so expensive? Let's begin by getting the obvious reason out the way. Electric cars are expensive because they are new technology. I mean, they're not. They've been around for about 180 years, but to be fair, there was like a 150 year gap in the middle where we weren't really trying that hard. And if we're being honest, it's only in the last decade or so that the world's leading car brands have really knuckled down to the task of building electric vehicles in a way that is scalable and profitable. And the sticking point here is the battery itself. Before electric cars came along, the biggest machines that we used to power by battery was like power tools. Anything bigger than that, and you just plug it straight into the mains, which obviously not really an option for electric cars unless you have a very long extension cord. And now suddenly we need these enormous batteries that are big enough and powerful enough to propel a two ton vehicle down the road for hundreds of miles and we need to be able to charge them very quickly and they need to have long lives and they need to be recyclable. And if I'm being honest with you, the technology that we're working with today is still fairly primitive. The battery pack in a Tesla Model S long range weighs in at about 540 kilos, which is only slightly less than an old Lotus Elan. And it's good for about 400 miles of range. Now, in today's world, that is absolutely cutting edge technology, but 10 years from now, we are going to wet ourselves laughing at how rubbish that is. To use an imperfect example, consider computer storage. In 1981, Apple released a hard drive called the Profile. It was about the size of a cereal box, it had a mighty five megabytes of storage, and it cost three and a half thousand dollars. This, this is my external hard drive. It's got two terabytes of storage, that's 400,000 times more than the Apple profile, and it cost me like 80 quid. The engine that goes into a brand new Ford Fiesta is in absolutely no way groundbreaking. It's just an engine. We've been making them for decades and decades. We know how to do it. It's tried and tested. It's an engine. But the battery that powers your new Tesla, your new Rivian, your new VW ID4 is at the very cutting edge of what is possible right now. That's kind of cool and quite expensive. 
But it's not the only reason. Let's come back to the Ford Mustang Mach-E and the Honda E, two of the first electric cars from two of the world's best economy car makers. Not exactly entry level, are they? These are seriously fancy cars, much fancier than the average Ford or Honda that you're likely to see on the road. And this is because many brands are deliberately going up market for their first couple of electric cars. Now, why is that? Why would a brand like Honda that makes the lion's share of its profit selling tiny cheap cars to very young people and very old people decide to go so fancy and posh with its first EV when that's so different to its usual cars? Well, as a general rule of thumb, the more expensive the car, the bigger the profit margin. Because battery tech is still new and expensive, electric cars are more difficult to make profit off than petrol powered cars, but car makers seem to have twigged that they can essentially hide that electric car premium and counteract the reduction in profit simply by adding a couple of extra touch screens and some fancy slidey buttons and a heads up display and selling the car as a premium product with a premium price. And on top of that, there is another slightly more controversial theory as to why EVs cost more than petrol powered cars, which was recently talked about in a video on our channel by Richard Tinfoil Hat Beach. <laughs> and I definitely recommend giving that video a watch if you haven't already, but just quickly, here is the gist of it. There is a theory that car makers might be sandbagging, deliberately inflating the price of EVs to buy themselves more time. Transitioning from building ICE cars, as many of these brands have been doing for the last hundred years, into making EVs is going to be a big, expensive faff for legacy car makers. And some people believe that they are actively trying to delay that process by pricing most of us out. Now, exactly how much weight to give that theory is up for debate. I personally don't have enough cold, hard data on the cost of building batteries to have a strong opinion on it myself, but I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments. I'm sure you'll have some spicy ones. So that, in a nutshell, is why electric cars cost as much as they do. The obvious follow-up question is, for how much longer? How long are we going to have to wait until there is no premium on electric cars? It's impossible to know exactly how long, but the good news is, it's happening faster than you might think. The price gap between electric cars and petrol cars has already shrunk dramatically thanks to battery tech getting better, cheaper, cleverer, and thanks to car makers getting better at making electric cars, and that will continue to happen. Here's a wild stat for you. Before VW had the ID3, they had the e-Golf, and it was literally just a petrol-powered Golf with the engine pulled out and some batteries put in. And you would think that that is a much cheaper way of building electric cars, right? But VW claims that the ID3 per unit costs around 40% as much to build. That is incredible. So how have they managed that? Well, they've done it by building the ID3 on a dedicated EV platform in a shiny new EV factory, which by the way is carbon neutral. And this has just made the whole process so much simpler and more cost effective. Naturally, there will have been a huge cost attached to designing and building that EV platform and that shiny new factory. And that's a pill that every legacy car maker is just gonna have to swallow sooner or later. But now that VW has done that, they are in a great position to churn out lots and lots of new electric cars in a really cost-effective way. And that is why a new ID3 barely costs any more than a similarly specced petrol-powered Golf. But the thing I really want you to take away from this video, and something that doesn't seem to be common knowledge quite yet, is that even now, while there is still a premium on electric cars, buying one still might be the most cost-effective option for you if you consider the first few years of ownership. EVs pay negligible road tax. They have minuscule maintenance fees. And get this, you're not going to believe this. They don't need petrol. You're joking. A website called Clean Technica has done some really good research into this, comparing the new ID3 with the new petrol-powered Golf over the first five years of ownership as far as the costs. And guess what? The electric boy absolutely wipes the floor with the Golf. Okay, this video has been pretty dense and I need to lie down now, so let's just sum this up neatly, shall we? EVs cost more than ICE cars because battery technology is new and expensive. But that won't be the case for too much longer. And in the meantime, it may already be more cost-effective for you to buy an electric car because of the tiny, tiny running costs. So there you have it. That was a fairly straightforward explanation as to why EVs cost as much as they do. Let me know in the comments, do you think that car makers are sandbagging? Are they deliberately slowing this whole thing down by making electric cars more expensive than they need to be? Or is Richard just mental? Let me know down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you soon.